So uh, welcome everyone again. My name is James Curran. I'm an associate professor at the University of Sydney. I'm the academic director of the Australian Computing Academy. Um, and I was one of the authors of the Australian Curriculum Digital Technologies. Um, and I'm here with Kenny uh, from our team in the ACA. Kenny, do you want to say hello? Hello, everyone. Maybe we should go to this slide, which has our name. Yeah, let's got our names on even. Um, I'm a computing education specialist at the Australian Computing Academy and worked as a software engineer for a number of years. And today's session's on data representation. And uh, data representation is actually one of the really great topics to be talking about when people are at home because data rep is one of those ones that you can do a lot of great teaching with uh, without having a device. And there's a lot of opportunities around the home to, uh, to tie in with uh, data representation as well. We're going to keep it fairly high level today and talk about really the, the, the kind of elements of data representation as a key concept and then talk about what that looks like in a few different bands. And then we're going to show you a bunch of ACA activities that we've been putting together, both things that we've used in our workshops, um, our professional development workshops over a while, but then also some activities that we've written up specifically for um, people teaching at home in our DT at home series. And you can find more of those by looking at the um, ACA website. So go to aca.edu.au. In the background, if you feel like I'm not talking fast enough and you can find um, those DT at home activities on the resources page. Thanks, Kenny. Uh, so first bit of context, we've got the Australian curriculum here. Uh, and you'll see that there's this, uh, what are they called, threads? Yep. And a thread for about representation of data here. And if you're more interested in knowing exactly what the curriculum is like, you can go to the uh, ACARA website, is that correct? Or the Australian curriculum? Yeah, so, so this is still on the Australian curriculum website. The thing to point out here is that that, um, that previous view that Kenny had is, the, is a two page PDF version of the curriculum. If you haven't seen that version before, we really like it because it shows all of the different bands um, nice and succinctly on a two pager and it shows that each of the key concepts and here data representation being one of those 10 key concepts has a content description that um, continues to develop um, both the sophistication of those ideas and new ideas within that key concept right from foundation or kindergarten or preppies, whatever you call it in your jurisdiction right through to year 10. So um, and data representation is the one we're on today. And so you can get that from the Australian Curriculum website if you'd like to take a look. Um, but uh, first, let's talk about what data representation is. Um, do you want to talk about this, James? Yeah, this sure. So data representation describes how data is represented and structured symbolically for storage and communication by people and in digital systems. And if you've still got your annotation tool out there, I want you to stick a stamp on what word you think I think is the most important word in this definition. So grab one of these stamps. I'm not going to do it because otherwise you'll guess that the word I'm choosing is, is the one. Just go and stick a stamp on which word you think is important. Oh, somebody's already had a crack at people, symbolically represented. We've got a bit of everything. Someone's gone with the open quote. Oh, it's all happening now. I'll give you another few seconds to stick a sticker on there somewhere. All right, symbolically is getting quite a showing. That's good. Yep, symbolically is important. Um, but I'll let you know that the word that I think is most important in this definition, and I wrote most of this definition, the one that I didn't like is that the ACARA bureaucrats thought that data had to be plural, so they've switched it to R. I, I continue to reject that as the right answer. So um, I believe that the most important word here is people. And that's because data representation is something that humans have been doing for thousands and thousands of years. This is not something that is new and part of digital technologies alone. So um, we're going to talk about a whole lot of different representations that humans use to communicate ideas and so on. And then really what we see in digital technologies is just the latest and greatest um, uh, representations that we can represent all kinds of aspects of our life. Everything you have in the digital system in front of you is represented ultimately in binary, um, but humans have been representing things for a very, very long time. Thanks, Kenny. 
Uh, yep. Uh, and for the next time that we use those annotation tools, um, they're under the view options at the top of your, your screen, your Zoom screen. Um, All right. So here we've got a number of representations of what a dog. Um, some of them are more abstract than other representations. So you can see here we've got an emoji of a dog. It looks like a very particular kind of dog. We've got a no dog sign. We've got the word dog, uh, which coincidentally enough is actually uh, the word for dog in English, but it's also the word for a uh, dog in Mbabaran, which is a North Queensland um, uh, indigenous language. Uh, we've also got a dog and the word dog in Morse code in English. Um, so you can see here that abstraction is key to being able to communicate information and that's what data representation is all about. Okay. Um, so what exactly is abstraction? Abstraction involves hiding details of the idea that are not relevant to the um, to the solution or to communication. It's all about people, as James said. Uh, you're focusing on a manageable number of aspects. Yeah, and abstraction is something we do all the time. So it, it sounds complicated, um, but, but it's, it's the thing that humans do every time they communicate. So the, the examples that I like to give when we're normally doing PD workshops is if, um, if you sat down next to someone at a, an event and they were new to you and you said something like, how, do you, how did you get here today as a way of kind of chatting about, you know, um, kind of a how's the weather type thing. And they said they, uh, their alarm went off at 6.05. They sat up, turned left, put their left foot down, put their right foot down, um, stood up, turned right, turned to the, walked to the end of the bed and continued with that level of detail to they described every single thing that happened between there um, and sitting right next to you. Um, at the morning tea break, you would get up and try and find a different place to sit because that person really doesn't understand how humans actually communicate with each other. We all of the time moderate the level of detail we use when describing a thing and whether that's a set of instructions or whether that's just a narrative or or what it is we're describing. We change the level of detail when we're communicating, we change the level of detail when we're trying to solve a problem all of the time. Um, and so if your best friend, you know, well, if, if a stranger asks you, how are you going? Then you're probably gonna say good, even if one of your limbs has just fallen off. Um, whereas if your best friend asks you, how are you going? That's an opportunity for a Shakespearean monologue of all of the problems in your life. So, um, uh, humans use abstraction all of the time in every form of communication and abstraction ties in very closely with data representation. Thanks, Joe. So what we're going to do next is I'm going to get you to go to slido.com in your web browser uh, and I'm going to get you to name some examples of data representation in your house. So you can submit multiple times to this slido.com. If you enter in the data, uh, data code there, you can join into the slido uh, poll, uh, and you can think about things around your house where there's some data involved. Yeah, and think about, I mean, that, that previous slide we had was different representations of dog. Um, these don't need to be examples that are just in your house, but we're using houses at the moment since that's uh, our, our new teaching environment for many people. So, I mean, just looking in front of me, I can see a keyboard with a bunch of different symbols on it. That's an example of some data representation. Yeah. And um, uh, I've got an Ikea lamp and I'm just having a look on the inside of the lamp. It's got a whole bunch of symbols um, to, uh, one of them seems to be telling me not to throw this thing in the bin, for example. Um, there's also text around there. Um, yeah, I think almost within sight, uh, within uh, within sight of where you're sitting, it's highly likely you'll see that there are multiple representations that that we use. How are we going with those answers, Kenny? Looks like we've got seven responses so far, so we'll give you another thirty seconds or so. I can see lots of good, good examples here. I won't reveal them. Quite yet. Well, 
while we're doing that, um, if you've finished providing input, why don't you uh, click yes for us on um, uh, the participants list. If you've used something like Slido before and like it and whack on a no if you um, uh, haven't used it before. The event code is data. All right, shall we take a look at what yeah, we Yeah, let's have a look at the 12 answers we've got so far. So it looks like the most popular one at the moment is remote. Remote. Uh-huh. Uh, was that um, remote control? Are people mainly uh, watching us from their lounge rooms today? Um, so the uh, remote control is a good example because it actually has a number of buttons that are a standard symbolic representation of things. So the play button, for example, is that uh, rightward facing triangle. You've got the stop button, you've got pause. Again, a perfect example of a bunch of symbols that represent a particular idea. I mean, my favorite version of this these days, of course, if you're um, old enough to have used floppy disks like me, the fact that um, modern kids see the floppy disk symbol as being save and no idea uh, what a floppy disk even is, um, is just the way that technology goes. But a perfect example where a symbol can ultimately represent something that, um, uh, that its original purpose has even disappeared. Some other great examples, IKEA instructions, recycling guidelines, they're always a bit of a mystery. Um, the laundry tags, um, on the fire extinguisher, anything that needs a set of instructions that you want to be um, multilingual or ideally not requiring any language at all. And so that example of the, the dog we had previously with a cross through it um, is another perfect example. So some good ones there. Mm -hmm. The oven. Yeah. Um, uh, love to hear on chat whoever was thinking of the oven example or um, what the symbols are there. What's interesting is some of the basic human ones I haven't seen yet either. So I've um, seen quite a number that are kind of symbolic representations, but I haven't seen, for example, much in, much in the way of text books there, which is great. Um, also haven't seen much in the way of numbers. They're one of um, our greatest representations as humans too, is that the, um, is our numerical representations of things uh, are really important. All right, Kenny, let's keep moving. I noticed that someone's clicked the go faster button, which is always my problem in life. Too many things to say and not enough time to say them in. So in foundation to year two, students are expected to recognize and explore patterns in data and represent data as pictures, symbols, and diagrams. Now that pig dog example that I got um, the participants to start drawing uh, at the beginning of this webinar, we're gonna come back to that in a minute as an example of exactly that that is representing the idea of a pig or a dog um, as, as exactly one of those um, pictures. All right. All right, so we're gonna do the annotation again here and what we're gonna get you to do, so if you haven't looked, you can go to the view options and click annotate, we're gonna get you to do some drawing here. Um, there are also stamps. Oh, actually not, not drawing, uh, this one's about Stamping questions. So what does this first symbol here mean? So you might have seen these laundry symbols on your clothing before. Uh, what does this one mean? So put a stamp next to which of the, the options it is on the um, uh, right hand side. I might have forgot to put the right option in. <laughs> yeah, if you put the no ironing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that. <laughs> yeah, we need to annotate over the word no. So, yep, everyone's decided that that's an iron. You are all, in fact, correct and great. It looks like everyone has um, done Kenny's work for him. They've covered over the no. Nice. Nice uh, one, team. All yep. right, we'll go on to the next one then. So, now, what is the, the uh, hand? I think I can give you a bit of a hint. That's a hand. Oh, look, it's hand washing. Excellent. So, so the interesting thing about some of these symbols is that, uh, for example, this first one, if you didn't know it, uh, if you didn't see it without the, with the context, you might not know what that big square looking thing is. Yeah. 
Is that a strangely shaped A, for example? Yeah. All right. Uh, now for this bottom one in the bottom left. Tumble dry twice. Hmm. Yeah. So what's interesting here is that people figured out that it's tumble dry, which is correct. But the dots in the laundry symbols, there's a convention there where uh, the number of dots corresponds to how warm things should be. They can get uh, laundry symbols that have five dots in them. And it means you, know, you can put this up to like 60 degrees or something like that. Yeah, so it's not tumble dry twice. In fact, I don't know, is there an instruction for tumble dry twice, Kenny? No, that's just something. <laughs> that was the distractor. All right, the next one should hopefully be obvious. The bottom one in the bottom right here. Now, some people are choosing tumble dry once still. Yeah, so it's not once and twice. There are, there's not an instruction that we're aware of that says put it back through the tumble dryer a second time. Although occasionally when I put too many things in the tumble dryer, that's exactly the operation I need to perform. So the thing about this as an activity is first of all, um, these laundry symbols exist on many clothes. Uh, it's an activity you can do in class by um, uh, bringing in a, a range of clothing that has the different laundry symbols on. Um, it's a, an activity that you can do at home as well. And I think our next slide, Kenny, if I remember correctly, is our um, pointer to where this activity exists on the ACA uh, website. Is that right? It is about uh, drawing your own laundry. Oh, drawing your own. That's right. First. Do this one so that way you can get to everything else. But this is an activity you can run in your classroom, like we yeah. did with my dogs earlier, get the kids to draw their own laundry symbols. Um, but we do have an activity called DT Laundry, which goes through laundry symbols, what they mean, what makes a good symbol, what makes it easy or hard to understand symbols. Um, yeah, so the, um, the, the, the key thing about these symbols is again, that for a, we want to represent a piece of information that no matter what your language is and what your literacy level, you could understand what those instructions mean. Now, of course, because they are actually quite complex instructions, if you're not actually familiar, some of those symbols are pretty obvious. I think the iron is reasonably obvious and the hand wash is pretty good. Um, but as you all just demonstrated, the, um, the tumble dry on hot versus cold is not one um, that would easily work. Um, and uh, yes, it's true that this is not something that necessarily kids would do the laundry, but most kids do have some clothes that have laundry tags on at least. And it's a good opportunity to demonstrate the digital technologies or data representation actually pops up all, all, all over the place in people's lives. Okay, Kenny. So by year three, four, we're expecting students to not only be able to represent um, data, so represent ideas and so on with pictures, um, uh, diagrams and so on, but by three, four, we want them to recognize that the same data can be represented in different ways. And we already saw an example of that earlier on with dog. So dog could be represented as a picture, it could be represented in, um, as a word, it could be said, um, it could be a symbol, there's all kinds, of, or it could be a photo. There's all kinds of different representations of that exact idea. And for kids to really understand the, the true extent of this and the number of different representations that exist, we like to talk about um, languages themselves. So if, if we go back to our pig example and say, well, in English, we've agreed that if I take the sounds I and g, um, and I run them together quickly, that's going to correspond to the farm animal. But we know that other languages do completely different sounds for exactly the same um, uh, underlying idea, which means that um, language is actually nothing more than a conventionalized sequence of quite arbitrary sounds that we've all agreed conveys a particular meaning. That is, you know, when we say a word in a language, it is a symbolic representation that we have all agreed on, but there's nothing fundamentally piggish about the word pig. Um, and we see that because of how different it is across all other languages. But James, what about the sound a pig makes? What about oink? Well, yeah, you would think that oink, um, you know, onomatopoeia, and I think our next slide gives an example of this. 
Um, onomatopoeia, you think, um, represents the sounds, but of course, no pig has ever said oink, right? Um, so onomatopoeia uh, purports to represent a sound more accurately, often a natural sound. But here are some different examples of where, uh, of, uh, so the Dutch say knor knor rather than oink oink, the Polish say kwi kwi, which sounds a little bit weird. And of course, and with one of my other uh, hats, I started a company called Grok Learning. Well, um, unfortunately, it turns out that Grok means oink um, in Indonesian. So unfortunately, I started a company called Oink Learning, which just goes to show that market research is, uh, is challenging. By the way, there's a great little book um, by a um, illustrator or uh, cartoonist, James Chapman. We've got an example of it here on the right um, that shows for a whole bunch of different animals what their onomatopoeia sound is in different languages. And um, uh, that's a great opportunity to get kids understanding that we can all use quite different sounds to represent the same idea and that often the representation of something is quite arbitrary. All right, so we're gonna go back to our pigs and dogs here, and we're gonna try and figure out if we can guess uh, whether there were a pig or a dog shown earlier. So here we've got a- <laughs> Nice one, Kenny. Um, and if you go back to slido.com and uh, <coughs> data event name, then we should be able to vote on whether we think it's a is pig. Is this a pig or is this a dog? So looks like we've got Six people all voting for Doug. Yeah. All right. There's a high degree of confidence that this picture is a dog. Well done, whoever. Oh, there's always a contrarian in there somewhere. All right, let's move to another one, Kenny. All right. Uh, so we're going to reset the poll. Now, normally, of course, what we do in class is we'd actually get kids to draw their own pictures of a pig and a dog. Um, and we're going to do a webinar on this with the New South Wales Department of Education um, on Thursday with some schools and we're going to get them to draw each and then they would normally have this discussion in pairs, but here we're doing this version. All right, pig and dog. All right, someone drew this one. Was it meant to be a pig or a dog? <laughs> I'm pretty confident it's a pig. Look at that snout. I'm, I'm going with pig. I'm calling it. All right. Okay, we'll do one more. Uh, let's go with this one. Yes. All right. Is this a pig or a dog? I'm going to reset the poll. Clear it again, folks, before you have a vote. All right. Have another vote now. And that very quickly turned into a pig on the vote. Excellent work. Now, the reason why we do these examples is because... Um, what you're all doing isn't just drawing a photorealistic pig or a photorealistic dog. In fact, none of those were even close to photorealistic. But you're actually appealing to an underlying symbolic representation of a pig and a dog that we um, humans in our uh, Western culture have. Um, and you can see here, for example, um, all of the pigs you'll notice except um sue's front on one probably because she was trying to use all of the um all of the circles what do they all have in common well they have a curly tail um and they have a roundish snout from the front in fact um as this central picture of a pig demonstrates the blue one with the thick lines is you actually don't need to have many characteristics at all to be able to represent that as a pig. Now, a dog, on the other hand, is much more challenging to draw. There isn't the same idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic characteristics for drawing that symbol. So, for example, if the picture was um, no dogs at the airport, and we saw an example of a no dog sign previously, it would be probably even easier to draw a, a picture of a no pig sign because it would be much more recognizable um, at least to, um, uh, to Westerners. Now, what's interesting about this is you've relied on characteristics that are actually not always biologically correct. So there are species of dogs that um, have curly tails, or breeds of dogs, sorry, that have curly tails. And, um, uh, and there are some breeds of pig that don't actually have curly tails. So you're all relying on a symbolism 
that comes up in lots of places. So if you think about pigs you've seen um, in, uh, in popular culture, Peppa Pig is a perfect example of a pig that has all of the, the stereotypical characteristics. And the thing is we rely on those stereotypes to be able to communicate an idea effectively because that's part of the symbolism of that underlying representation. And these are the kind of conversations you can start having with kids about how information is represented. Um, uh, yes. All right. And, and here we've got an example of that. Sorry, Kenny. On the uh, DT at home site, we've got an, a, a written up example of exactly how to do this activity, either the at home version or doing it in, um, in your class. And again, what I would be doing is I would be tying this back to the idea that the same information can be represented in different kinds of ways and get kids to think about all of the different ways they could communicate the idea of a pig or a dog or some other word. And we should be clear that a lot of these resources are uh, not just for three, four kids. They can be done with kids of all ages to introduce yeah. them. And in fact, the pig dog activity is something that I've done from kindergarten with kindergarten kids right through to um, university students and teachers and academics. It works really well. It's just what changes is the, the complexity of the conversation you have at the same time. All right. So, all righty. So, sorry, go ahead, Kenny. We start talking about how whole numbers are used to represent all data in digital systems. So, going from the idea that there is representation of data to thinking about how data is represented by digital systems. Uh, for example, you can use num numbers to represent pictures, you can use numbers to represent sounds, words, emoji, and much more concepts. Yeah. And in fact, this is the this is kind of the intermediate step between thinking about the original representation of something and eventually how it's represented inside a digital system. So the sequence we're going to go from is in the early years, we're going to get kids thinking about representation as an idea. By the time we get to year five and six, we're going to talk about ways to represent these different kinds of information using numbers. By the time we get to year seven and eight, we're gonna talk about how those numbers in turn get represented in binary and also look at some specific um, uh, types of data and how they're represented using whole numbers. Yeah. So who can guess what this set of numbers means? Put your guess in the chat if you can. can figure it, it's a word. Nice one. Good. So we've got a response from Sue and Mike. A bunch of people have noticed that it's hello. Uh, Excellent. Friendly, yes. What's that? You just being friendly. <laughs> they are. Um, uh, so um, the, what is the, how did we get to the fact that it's hello? Well, H is, uh, if you start with A as the first letter of the alphabet and B, 2, C, 3, and so on, you end up getting to H being the eighth letter of the alphabet, E being 5, L being 12. So there's two of those. And that was actually one of the big hints that really helps with this word, I think. And then finally, O is 15. Now, you might think, oh, okay, that's a toy example. Um, but actually, this is exactly the same way that digital systems ultimately represent letters. Um, not with the number one for A. In fact, lowercase a um, corresponds to the number 97 um, and capital A corresponds to 65, but then quite logically B corresponds to 98 and so on. So exactly this kind of representation is how they're used inside digital systems. Kenny's opened up a thing called an ASCII table. So ASCII is one of the original um, uh, representations that we used for numbers uh, for um, letters as numbers and you can see the, the the column that's red on this table corresponds to those letters and you can see that lowercase a corresponds to decimal 97 and it includes all of the basic punctuation and things like that as well um, but like language it's an arbitrary representation um, so you can think of different conventions to uh, represent messages. So if you'd like to make your own message here, uh, and we're going to try and see if we can guess any see of them. whether we can decode any of these messages. So yeah, think about how you might 
and choose to represent things. You can use the same representation we used before if you're struggling to think of another one. So A equals one, B equals two and so on. Um, if you're feeling brave, you can do it in ASCII and start at 97. Um, or you can think about uh, other ways you might represent uh, a message using only numbers. And while you're having a quick go at that, um, uh, Mr. Cairns, your comments. Um, we'd love to run one of these in the New South Wales Department of Education. So please feel free to let them know uh, that you've liked this material. Um, as I said, uh, a bunch of the team are actually running um, a webinar for students on Thursday. So we've got, um, uh, we've got an 11 a.m. session uh, for primary and we've got a 2 p.m. session for secondary students. That's in fact gonna touch on some representation related things. Um, uh, not so many of these examples, we're gonna do pig and dog and we're gonna do a couple of others, but we've got some new material there for that session too. So please um, have a look at that dear Department of Education webinar series, 1918. My All guess right. is that maybe that's high, but that would be the other way. Oh, right? oh, we've got some fancy pants that have turned it into binary. There's always one of those. <laughs> I'm gonna guess that if you did that in binary, you use some tool to do that um, rather than, um, uh, um, writing those ones and zeros out. Excellent, good. See, that would be gab. 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 All right, so um, you can see that there's a range of different ways you could represent these things. Um, the thing with the secret code stuff, so Miss Parsons just mentioned it, Kids love this stuff. I mean, kids have been passing messages backwards and forwards in school um, forever. Uh, this basically gives kids a way of doing that and keeping their message secret on the way across. Um, we found it works really well to actually give kids an ASCII table um, and get them to use that table to do the translation. If you want to be particularly tricky, um, you can, oh, triple O, excellent. That's a great one. Um, so, uh, sorry, I've interrupted myself just because that triple O example is so cool. So triple O, uh, if you said uh, ring triple O, uh, people would automatically know that, that you meant a phone number, it meant emergency services. So that's a really cool example of communicating a particular message because that symbol of three, of three zeros corresponds to, again, culturally, um, a symbol that we all recognize. Great example. Um, so Mr. Cairns, the Making Jam Sandwiches, that's actually us this week and it's Vegemite Sandwiches and it's gonna touch on both algorithms and um, data representation all in one go. It's gonna be a load of fun. In fact, Coles just delivered all of the necessary ingredients for my Vegemite Sandwiches for Thursday this afternoon. Um, so one of the challenges that we've got that uh, is an online challenge where you can do some uh, programming in the Grok Learning platform. Uh, it allows you to uh, discuss with your students how to present, represent and communicate pictures and text using uh, micro bits. Um, so if you can see my screen here, put a little micro bit there. Um, they basically communicate over radio and in order to facilitate that communication, you have to talk about how data is represented. Um, and another challenge that we've got, which is part of the cybersecurity challenges, is uh, one about encoding and decoding secret messages. It's pitched at year seven, eight students, but it uses those five, six concepts of how to represent data as numbers. Yeah, and so I think probably one of the key messages that we want you to get out of this session is data representation is a concept that you can really start developing as an idea. And as teachers, you're teaching representations every single day. You know, you're teaching about spelling, you're teaching about grammar, you're teaching about numbers and how to manipulate those representations in various ways. Humans use representation all of the time. 
in digital systems, we've taken those representations through to a form that we can manipulate electronically in circuits. But ultimately, representation is a much deeper idea that we've been doing for a very, very long time. And one might argue that representation is actually one of the defining characteristics of human as opposed to um, other animal behavior. Although bees do dance to show other bees. It's true, it's true. And I think actually we've, um, you're right, we've been learning a lot over the last few years by watching um, lots of different animals and discovering that they too have representations of lots of different things. So maybe I'm wrong, Kenny. So in year seven and eight, we expect students to move beyond just um, understanding representation and start to focus much more specifically on representations in digital systems. So in particular, how text, image and audio is represented. Um, now the thing is here in the Australian curriculum, we really got squished for how many words we were allowed to write in each content description. And so this is actually two separate things. Number one, we want kids to understand how text, image and audio data is represented using whole numbers. And then separate to that, we want kids to understand how whole numbers are represented in binary. So it's not important that we represent, um, uh, that kids know how text is represented in binary. I would split it into those two phases and talk about them separately. And I guess the, the reason why I, I kind of consider binary to be the ultimate representation is that we've worked out that we can represent almost anything um, in our human experience as a series of numbers, but in turn only use two symbols for those numbers, a zero and a one. So every single thing that you've got on your device, whether it's um, text, whether it's image, whether it's audio, whether it's video, uh, whether it's some other kind of numerical measurement, whether it's an, a, a currency amount and so on, are all ultimately represented using billions upon billions of ones and zeros in your device. Um, and uh, I think, you know, with a modern computer, you might have, say, eight gigabyte of RAM. You've literally got billions and billions of ones and zeros just representing all of the things that you see in front of you every day. And then, of course, abstraction is the tool that we use to sit further and further away from that. We wouldn't be able to build half the things we can build computationally if we still had to worry about the ones and zeros. They're down at a very, very low level of abstraction, and we build more and more representations that sit on top of that so that we can forget about it. So we've got ones and zeros. Well, even below that, we've got electrical circuits that we think of in terms of manipulating ones and zeros, which are in turn representing whole numbers, which in turn then represent text. And then we just build those layers on top of each other using increasingly um, sophisticated uh, abstractions. Uh, so we're going to do an activity here, which is about representing binary numbers. Uh, and so what I'm going to get you to do is to use the drawing tool and get the little rectangle tool and get you to hide some of these uh, numbers such that there are only a certain number of dots left. So I've blanked out a number of dots and I can see that there are only five dots here. And now I know that there are 064s, 032s, 016s, 08s, 14, 02s, and 11. And so from this, I can see that the representation in binary of the number five is 0000101. So what I'm going to get you to do is to each uh, claim a number. So, you know, uh, put a little symbol above it or something. This is, this is going to be quite bad. So yeah. the, the, the first person to draw something over one of the letter, one of the digits, you get to own that. So, all right, Heather, bridge P. Uh, all right. Um, Patricia's on one. We need someone. All right, Cherie, you're on 32s. Let's see someone on eights, fours. Okay. G Stewart, you're on eights. Okay, it looks like we've got all the numbers pretty much covered. So now what we want to do is uh, we want to represent the number. What are we going to do, Kenny? Let's do 22. So uh, we'll, we'll clear. All right, good. Yep. So 
We want to keep the two. We want to cover the ones. Nice. Okay. What else do we want to cover? So we want to keep the four and we want to keep the 16. Okay. Looks like not every, ah, there we go. Nice one, Cherie. And can we get the, um, all right. Oh, nearly there. <laughs> now. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. So, We've got the 64 covered, so that's zero. We've got the 32 covered, so that's zero. We've got the 16 open, so that's a one. We've got the eight covered, that's a um, zero. We've got the four open, so that's a one. Looks like two should be covered. Maybe no one claimed the two. Oh, right. No, I said 22, sorry. I've just forgot my own number. <laughs> oh dear, I've been so busy watching this covering and uncovering, I lost my way. So. The number 22 consists of a 16, a four, a two, and nothing else. And so we can cover over those other panels. Now, what we've done here is a bit of an ad hoc version of an activity that's already um, been developed uh, as part of the CS Unplugged site. Um, uh, Nicola, if you could shove the URL up there for um, that activity, that would be fantastic in the chat. So CS Unplugged produces a number of really great activities. You can basically, oh, there it is right there. Perfect. Um, so you can um, print out some cards that you get a bunch of kids to stand up at the front of the car class and flip the cards backwards and forwards over. Um, and we've found this is one of the most effective ways to get kids to understand how binary works. Now, let me be clear, if you're in year seven and eight, what's expected of that? So in year seven and eight, I don't expect students to be able to rapidly do um, a decimal to binary conversion, nor do I expect um, kids to be able to do things like binary addition. We've got these amazing things called computers. They can do those calculations billions of times a second. So why would we have humans do that? What we care about is that kids have an understanding of how the representation works, because later on, they're going to see examples of that representation um, and its impact on how, uh, how they do certain things with computers. For example, an image is typically made up of um, uh, three or four different numbers per individual pixel representing that color those numbers go from zero up to 255. If you understand a little bit about binary, you can understand why that goes from zero to 255, because it's the numbers you can represent using eight bits, uh, an eight bit binary um, number. Uh, and if you wanna know more about how to represent pictures and text and emoji and uh, using these binary numbers, then you can try the Data Representation DT Challenge, um, which is on the ACA website. Yeah, and one of the things you might have noticed by now is that something we try to do frequently in the ACA is use programming activities to not only consolidate programming skills, but also um, to develop a deeper understanding of the other parts of the curriculum as we're going along. You could actually teach much of data representation without ever writing a bit of code if you wanted to, but we find actually doing a mixture of both or consolidating programming skills or also introducing programming at the same time as some of these representation ideas is a, is a great way of, um, of killing multiple birds with one stone. And let's face it, as a teacher, that's the thing you need to be doing all the time to fit the curriculum in. And I don't just mean digital technologies, I mean right across the board. So one of the things that's worth noting is that um, uh, in digital technologies, we've got these 10 key concepts and you'll see that, that the 10 key concepts, the uh, across the two page PDF that we saw previously, the ideas do flow from kindergarten through to year 10 for a particular key concept. But I, we also wanted to make it clear that data representation does actually also appear in some of the other um, content descriptions. So here, for example, in year seven and eight, under the data um, interpretation content description, students are expected to use structured data to model objects or events. To model something is essentially to represent both the idea of it and then also to represent the data of those objects and events. So structured data is another example of that. And of course, in many subjects, 
um, uh, when people talk about data representation. And unfortunately, the Australian curriculum mathematics is one of those. They'll often use data representation just to mean drawing a graph um, to, to visualize some data. But of course, here we mean it in a much broader sense. So data structures are also um, more sophisticated representations of data. So if you're teaching, um, say for example, lists in Python or, or arrays as they're often called in other languages or tables, or you're even using something like a spreadsheet um, and you've got columns and um, rows of data, you can tie that idea first of all back to your representing structured data and then tie that back again to the idea of representation itself. So it's a very powerful idea representation. You know, at the moment we're, we're using several representations. We've got text, I'm talking to you, we're using images. Almost all human interaction involves some level of representation and you should be frequently connecting it back to those deep ideas every time you come across it in a classroom. Yeah, uh, and so moving into nine and 10, we start talking about the relationships between the structured data. Um, so if you're uh, teaching 9 and 10 at, at the moment, you've probably done some SQL, um, maybe you've done some object-oriented programming. Uh, these are both uh, related to that idea of teaching about modeling entities and events and their relationships. Yep. Uh, I just want to call out um, Rhonda's great um, uh, post on chat. Yeah. Um, you can hide all kinds of interesting facts and ideas, convert them into binary or convert them into some other representation. Um, uh, there's, there's lots of cool ways that you can get kids engaging with things by hiding them, essentially. Uh, you can do things like create a treasure hunt uh, where the clues in the treasure hunt require decoding from one representation to another. Um, well, one thing that we've found that's really effective for getting kids to understand the idea of representation is you just split the class in half and in the ear of half the students on one side, you whisper a number into their ear and you tell them they have to communicate that idea without talking to the person on the other side. You might give them a small number first and they might say, you know, uh, well, that's a four, but then you'll give them a number that fits on two hands and they're going to do, you know, eight or something like that. And then you give them more and more complex things to represent and see how they develop their own ideas for, for representing those um, as you kind of make it harder for the representation to work. Alrighty, so in by the time you get to year nine and 10, so now we're in the elective um, digital technologies subjects uh, right around the country, we're expecting students to analyze simple compression of data and how content data is separated from his presentation. So simple compression, the idea of compression is essentially that we want to represent the same information, but using less space, where from a computing perspective, that less space means fewer bits. So using a smaller binary or whole number representation, how can we represent something in a, in a smaller amount of space? And the second thing while we're here, since it often causes a bit of mystery for teachers, how content data is separated from presentation. The simplest example of this is doing HTML and CSS. HTML represents the content or structure of a document and then CSS cascading style sheets represents how a browser should actually render um, that particular document. You can also look at Microsoft Word and the fact that the text that you're typing is the content, but then you should be using styles properly to separate the presentation from the content. Um, I'm pretty sure that we could lift the GDP of Australia alone by 1% just by getting people to use styles properly in Microsoft Word. Nothing scares me more when I see someone changing every single heading every time because they've not, um, not used those styles correctly. So, if, Kenny, I think our next thing is an example. Um, um, so if oh, I'm yes. confusing to you, then uh, we're going to give you an example of what that means. So here I've got a list of files that have uh, the marks for my class. Uh, which one should I use? So use your little stamp tool. Which one should I use in order to figure out the average mark for my class? Oops. So lots of people are liking that Excel file. One person likes a CSV, yeah. <clears throat> All right. Looks like Excel's the winner, Kenny. 
I've got I've got the files here. Unfortunately, my answer was not that. My answer was PNG. Let's go and have a look at that first. PNG first. Oh. Oops. Okay, let's open that PNG. Oh, there we go. There's, there's the PNG. So the PNG, you'll note, has all of the information there. Um, it has the students' names. It has the marks. But this is not a very useful representation to actually do things with. If I wanted to, say, for example, calculate the average marks of all of these um, students, I wouldn't be able to do that um, in any computational way. I'd have to take all of the numbers out um, by eye, add them together, and then calculate the average. Because, of course, I can represent that information there um, in an image but it's not necessarily the most useful representation for solving a particular problem. Um, and in fact, that's another thing that we're going to come back to in the, uh, in the Department of Education New South Wales webinar on Thursday is which representation is the most useful representation to solve a particular problem. All right, let's have a look at another one then, Kenny. Let's have a look at um, marks. Uh, let's look at the Excel file that everyone voted for. Um, yeah, I'm trying to figure out where it's disappeared to. <laughs> it's behind a bunch of things. There we go. So here in, in this example, we've now got an Excel file, which you would think is going to have the best possible representation. But notice the way the data has been put into this Excel document. So we've got the name and the marks, unfortunately, have been kept in the same column, which means that we can't do something like take the average because we don't actually have um, a numerical data in a whole column. In fact, one of the things that I think it's really important to talk with kids about when they're using spreadsheets is not just how a spreadsheet works, but actually how to set up the data in a spreadsheet, how to represent the data within the spreadsheet so it's most effective for calculating things, which is ultimately what you want a spreadsheet to be able to do. So let's have a look at the, um, the CSV file now, Kenny. That was the other big vote. Uh, yep, there we go. Oh, still opening in numbers. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you can tell we live in the Mac universe. So here, um, this is opened up in numbers, which is the um, Apple equivalent of a spreadsheet. Um, and now, because Kenny has actually got this data in proper columns, he can use the um, use the underlying representation of that data in columns to much more much more rapidly do calculations. So data representation is both a choice of the kind of tool and system that you're using to represent the data, but then within those systems, ensuring that you represent the data in a way that makes it easiest to do um, calculations or other data processing. So All righty, Kenny. Open the CSV in numbers, the spreadsheet, and uh, in text edit, which allows you to look at the text. So yep. the different representations of the same file. Yep. Um, Ellie's just popped in a comment saying that we can separate the data into columns using uh, data sort. So yes, if, you, if you've got yourself a spreadsheet that's in the wrong format, there are a range of tools um, for splitting data. Um, by columns and, and various things like that. Unfortunately, that doesn't help you with the image or the PDF. So if Kenny tries to copy this PDF content, um, and this is the danger when people share things like PDFs, if he then tries to paste that into Excel, you're gonna see this version here has created a terrible mess um, uh, because fundamentally, a PDF document is not designed to represent the logical structure of the document. A PDF is only designed to, is essentially a language designed to tell printers what to print where. Um, and uh, so you'll often find that the data, if you try and copy and paste, that will end up into a strange place. You would say that it doesn't separate the, the content from the presentation? You would absolutely say that it does not separate the content from its presentation. Yeah. Good one, Kenny. All right, let's move on because we're running late and I see the go faster buttons winking at me again. So um, there are a bunch of other great activities to get started with things like compression. So again, the CS Unplugged site um, has an activity on what's called run length encoding. And basically what run length encoding says is if multiple pixels in an image or in some other source of data have the same value, we could represent that by saying make 
uh, take this particular pixel value and copy it 10 times in a row. So it's a very simple compression technique. Um, it's one that was used in things like the Microsoft Windows original bitmap file format. Um, it's, uh, it's really quite effective if the image has large blocks of exactly the same pixel color. Um, it's not so great if you take something like a photo. Um, in fact, it's a compression technique that if you've got the wrong kind of input data can actually be larger than the original image was, but it's a very simple CS unplugged activity um, and great fun to play with too. So in terms of these different um, uh, ideas, um, one of the things that you'll find on the, ACA site, uh, the ACA's website is we like to unpack the curriculum and look at how a particular idea progresses over multiple bands. So in data representation, we've really got the idea of representation itself. Um, and you can see that starts from representing data as pictures, symbols, and diagrams, and then goes up all the way to saying, well, we can do quite sophisticated representations that allow us to store the same information in less space. We've got types of data. So students in year three, four, for example, are expected to understand that there are different types of data. By year seven and eight, we want to get to the point where kids are understanding particular data, uh, how particular types of data um, are represented in digital systems. And then finally, remember that we can connect this back to data interpretation as well, which also has this idea of representing or modeling data uh, modeling complex things like objects and events using sophisticated data representations. So I guess um, in, in summary, um, the first thing is, is that as humans, we use data representations every day. And for me, digital technologies is much more than just about the, the computers that we're all sitting in front of right now to be part of this um, webinar. Representation is a thing that humans have been doing since we were recognizably human. Um, we use pictures, language, symbols, writing, numbers, all kinds of representations all of the time. Those representations are continuing to evolve. So, you know, one of the ones that we're starting to, uh, you know, not starting to, but have been seen, uh, seeing a lot more recently is something like emoji. Um, something that I like to horrify English teachers with is to say that maybe in 50 years time, emoji will have become such a standardized part of the language that you can write a formal English essay and including emoji would be important. And in fact, your English teacher might even say, sorry, you've actually broken the grammar of this emoji because the, um, the smiley face must come after this particular um, uh, emoji because our representations continue to evolve and become more sophisticated. In terms of how that, how that corresponds to digital systems, well, the first step is to recognize that whole numbers can be used to represent all different kinds of data. Um, and specifically by year seven and eight, we want students to understand text, image, and audio as three examples of data that can be represented using whole numbers. And then finally, that those whole numbers can in turn be represented using just two digits, binary, um, and uh, then from there, we can build increasingly sophisticated representations using, um, using uh, more and more structure. So we can represent more and more sophisticated objects. Um, but really for me, the thing that's most important is for kids to understand the different representations that they're learning about at school and understand um, at a much deeper level how we communicate and manipulate information as humans. Um, I think we've got uh, just on the next slide, just a pointer back to the unpacking part of the, the ACA's website. So if you haven't already seen this, the original curriculum writing team. Um, so that's me, Bruce Feuder, um, Paula Christofferson from Victoria. Uh, I should have pointed out that Bruce is um, based in the ACT. Um, and Anna Kinane, um, based in Queensland, have been getting back together and unpacking the curriculum further and describing it in a bit more detail in terms of what it would actually look like in the classroom. So if you haven't seen it, I think you'll find the, um, that um, unpacking to be very useful. If you're in New South Wales or WA, where we um, have got a, a state specific version of the curriculum, you might find that you'll need to first of all go and look at the corresponding 
um, uh, New South Wales or WA content descriptions or content points as we call them here in New South Wales, and then see which of those links to particular Australian curriculum concepts, but um, you should be able to, to still find that, um, that mapping really useful. And then finally, if you're looking for more resources for digital technologies, including you'll see on that image there, the DT at home, we've got everything on the ACA resources page. Um, and um, there, there's a lot of different great activities there, keen for you to have a go at them. So I think probably at this point now, we'll, um, we'll finish. But, sorry, have we got more? Gosh, no wonder people are telling me to hurry. What have I missed, Kenny? Uh, just underneath the pictures of the resources, you can see there's uh, yes. a set of circles. If you see ones with the little pink circle, you can see that they have rep data representation as part of the activity. Yep, good one. Thanks, Kenny. Uh, I think that's it. So if um, anyone's got any questions, um, uh, feel free to answer those questions now. Um, next week's webinar, webinar, just while I'm waiting for people to type any questions, if they've got any, is going to be on digital systems. It's going to be presented by uh, Associate Professor Carsten Schutz, and I think he's with Penny Player, both from the ACA, um, and they'll be talking through a bunch of um, activities. If you didn't get to see all of this webinar because you turned up late, we are putting them up on YouTube, and we'll be sending a link to you. Um, to those, to all of the people that registered today, please feel free to distribute those um, to anyone else in your professional network. Um, and hopefully, we'll um, uh, we'll see many of you in next week's webinar. And if you've got any questions, feel free to whack them up now, um, and we'll answer them for the next little while. Uh, if you're feeling brave, you can also unmute yourself. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, folks. Thanks very much.